All right, guys, greetings. Um, I'm sure most of you are probably a little uh, overwhelmed at this point, but don't worry. This is a learning process for both you and I, and we're just going to do our best here. Um, hopefully, you've read up a lot on a lot of my um, postings already. Um, if you haven't, please do so. Um, but without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Um, we're going to pick up where we left off which I believe was on slide six. Uh, so we'll go ahead and do that, and hopefully you can uh, hear me clearly. Also, um, I will make sure to post uh, these uh, presentations to OSS Connect as well in case you uh, don't necessarily want to watch the video. Um, but, you know, if you want to just hear my voice, you know, you can watch the video as well. All right, so let's get going here. All right, so political ideas of the Renaissance. Uh, we begin by going over Ni Ni uh, Niccolo Machiavelli, who basically wrote The Prince. Uh, Machiavelli believed that one uh, can make this generalization about men. They are ungrateful, fickle, liars, and deceivers. They shun danger and are greedy for profit. A ruler should be willing to do anything to maintain, maintain control without worrying about conscience. All right, so like we discussed before with Machiavelli, he definitely stated that it was better to be feared um, as opposed to being loved. Um, so, and you can clearly see that in his um, belief uh, quote there. All right, so a little more on Machiavelli. Um, so it is better for a ruler to be feared than to be loved. A ruler should be quick and decisive in decision-making. A ruler keeps power by any means necessary. Uh, the end always justifies the means, according to Machiavelli, and be good when possible and evil when necessary. Humanism. And for those of you that don't know, this is uh, Da Vinci's The Vitruvian Man. Uh, it's basically just sort of um, geometric perfection on Da Vinci's part. Uh, he basically celebrated the individual um, and stimulated the study of Greek and Roman literature and culture. And he also contributed a lot of um, different inventions and contributed a lot uh, to uh, both science, mathematics, philosophy, etc. So you can basically consider him to be like a polymath. All right, so Renaissance art. So middle view art and literature focus on the church and salvation. Uh, the Renaissance art and literature focus on individuals and worldly matters along with uh, Christianity, of course, as we, as we discussed before, we started to move to a more secular, more scientific um, uh, focus of study as opposed to religious because we saw with the bubonic plague that religion didn't necessarily help with the plague. All right, Michelangelo. Uh, so he was born in 1475 on a small town near Florence, and is considered to be one of the most inspired men who ever lived. David. All right, so Michelangelo created his masterpiece, David, in 1504. Uh, about a year after creating David, Pope Julius II summoned Michelangelo to Rome, to Rome, sorry, to work on his most famous project, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Uh, this is a picture of the Sistine Chapel. Uh, between the years of 1508 to 1512, it was um, constructed. And the painting that you see depicted there is the Last Judgment. Um, and that was finalized in the years of 1536 to 1541. And as I think I stated before um, in a previous lecture, uh, Michelangelo was on his back for a extended periods of time to, in order to uh, finish the Sistine Chapel. So here we just have some more different um, paintings here. Uh, we have the creation of Eve, uh, the creation of Adam, okay, uh, the separation of light and darkness, and the last judgment, or last judgment as it's stated in the book of Revelation. All right, so the last judgment. Um, so again, as you can see depicted here, basically um, God will uh, deem those worthy will ascend into heaven, and then those not worthy will descend into hell.
All right, so this is the La Paeta, uh, 1499 marble sculpture, and it's basically the um, the Virgin Mary holding the uh, the body of her deceased son uh, Jesus. This is Moses. All right, and Moses, as you know, if you remember from our previous lectures, he basically was responsible in the book of Exodus, according to the book of Exodus, uh, responsible for leading the Israelites out of Egypt and to the promised land. And he was also responsible for giving the Jewish people the Ten Commandments. All right, da Vinci. All right, so he was a painter, sculptor, architect, and engineer. Basically considered to be a genius. He existed between the years of 1452 to 1519. The Mona Lisa, um, some experts agree, um, yeah, sorry, let me just go through this real quick. Some experts uh, might agree or disagree on whether or not um, the Mona Lisa was modeled after the likeness of da Vinci himself, but we don't know for sure. This is the Last Supper um, by da Vinci. Right, where Jesus basically um, uh, basically you know conducted the Last Supper with his apostles or disciples um, before he was betrayed by Judas um, and then eventually crucified by the Romans um, and basically this painting was using vertical and horizontal perspective just to kind of give uh, just sort of a better quality of uh, painting or picture. Uh, this composition draws your eye automatically to the subject of the painting, and it basically isolates Jesus from the rest of the elements in the painting. Here are some notebooks by da Vinci. As you can see, he had contributions to biomechanics, as well as um, just regular mechanics in general in terms of weaponry. All right, Raphael was a painter who existed between the years... Uh, 1483 to 1520. And these are just pictures of uh, cherubs here. Uh, this is the School of Athens, and a lot of famous people are depicted, as you can see in this painting. We have Michelangelo, um, Raphael, uh, da Vinci himself, as you can see in the uh, in the background. And this person right over here was a famous um, mathematician. I want to say it was Euclides. But I'm not 100% on that. Um, but you can you can check for yourself if you uh, Google search the School of Athens, and you can thank basically Euclides for your the geometry that you learned today. So, Plato looks to the heavens, or the ideal realm. Aristotle looks to this earth and the, for the here and now. So I think we've talked about this before, but there's a distinction, remember, between Plato and Aristotle. Aristotle definitely, as compared to Plato and Socrates, Aristotle definitely started to become more um, scientific in his explanation of the world as opposed to more metaphysical and philosophical uh, with Plato and Socrates. Oh, I was right. So yeah, so we have uh, Euclid, okay, um, Ptolemy, and Zoroaster, okay, and if you remember, Zoroaster was the main founder of the Zoroastrian uh, religion, which I think we discussed briefly in a previous uh, lecture. All right. Uh, Betrothal of the Virgin uh, is uh, by Raphael in 1504. And again, it's we can see how perspective sort of enhances the uh, the picture of the photo. Oops, sorry. This is the portrait of Giovanni Arnolfini and his wife in 1434 uh, during the Northern Renaissance by Jane, and it's basically a, um, it's by Jane Van um, Eek. Another portrait by Van Eek. A little more detail here. All right, so we have uh, Francesco Petrarch uh, wrote love poems in the vernacular. 
okay basically in the in the language in the common language in his area And just for your reference, in the in the previous slide when we talked about Ptolemy, he was a Greek mathematician, astronomer, geographer, and astrologer. Basically, he did things with astronomy. Um, so we have the Northern Renaissance. Sorry, Northern Renaissance, growing wealth in Northern Europe, uh, merged humanist ideas with Christianity. Uh, we also have the Gutenberg Bible, uh, which uh, was made possible by the Gutenberg Press, which was invented by Johannes Gutenberg. We have different uh, Northern Renaissance writers, such as Erasmus, The Praise of Folly in 1511, Sir Thomas More, and Utopia in 1516. Literature continued. Sorry. So the literature flourished during the Renaissance. This can be greatly attributed, as I stated before, by Johannes Gutenberg in 1455. Gutenberg printed the first book produced by using movable type, such as the Bible. And we have... Desiderius Erasmus, pushed for the vernacular form of the Bible. Uh, the praise of the folly used Turmer to show the immoral and ignorant behavior of people, including the clergy. He felt people should be open-minded um, and be kind to others. So you can see he was definitely a, a big proponent of moving towards a more scientific and enlightened world as opposed to an ignorant and sort of um, superstitious world uh, with religion. So Thomas More was an English humanist, wrote the Utopia, a book about a uh, perfect society, believed men and women would live in harmony, no private property, uh, no one is lazy, and all people are educated and the justice system is used to end crime instead of executing criminals. Of course, there's ideally there's really no such thing as a perfect utopia because um, many different people are different and they have different uh, differing opinions, of course. And that's pretty much it. So let's go ahead and exit out of here. Uh, appreciate you guys watching. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to use the Microsoft Teams or try to communicate with me through email. Um, like I said, um, we're all in this together. And um, just let me, you know, just email, email me if you have any questions. Um, or you can use the Microsoft Teams chat room. Um, or if you prefer the, um, the OSS connect chat room, let me know. Um, but I'll be here to answer uh, any of your questions. Of course, you want to make sure that you, uh, watch these videos and also do the weekly assignments. All right. All right. Later guys. Bye.